Hi, everybody. I'm Councillor Glenn Gower, and I'm here with Véronique Bergeron from my Stittsville Ward Office team. How are you, Véronique? I'm doing well, thanks. Uh, looking forward to this discussion today. This is the second episode of Developing Story. It's uh, a video series that we've started to talk about different issues around planning and development in our community. Uh, if you tuned into the first one, we, we looked at a very specific development proposal for Hazel Dean Crossings. And uh, in the course of that conversation, a, a question came up, which is, can't we just stop growth in our community? So that's what this episode is about, that big question we always hear whenever there's a new development application, can we stop growth in Stittsville? So that's what we're going to dive into today. Um, that's right. And we're going to be looking at what is growth? Um, why can, can we stop it? Why not? Why should we do it? And also, uh, where does the growth come from? So I wanted to bring up some typical comments that we, we receive, um, uh, you know, whenever there's a develop, development application. Um, this, these comments in particular are real comments. Uh, they're from a Facebook post about a development or rezoning application that we posted about uh, probably two weeks ago. And this is for a development application for rezoning in the Fernbank area. And uh, I just did a copy and paste here of some of the comments. And if I could figure out how, my share, how to share my screen. All right, here we go. So these are four comments that people posted uh, on that Facebook post. And I think they are really emblematic of the kinds of feedback we always receive whenever there is a new development proposed in our community. So uh, what about not allowing more housing development until commercial development starts? Um, surely they can pause and wait and see which way the economy goes. We, we hear this a lot now around COVID-19 and the impact. Um, how about better infrastructure to accommodate the increase of people and traffic? And there's way too much development in this area. So these are just a sample of some of the, the typical things that we hear about. And, and I get these concerns. Like, I understand them. What we wanted to do today is, is talk a little bit about maybe what's behind some of these concerns, maybe why some of the... Uh, concerns exist, what some of the uh, different factors are and, and how the city's making decisions around growth in our community. And we'll just kind of dive into some of these topics. But uh, mm -hmm. Veronique, um, you know, one of the things you do uh, in my office is um, uh, basically you, you keep a very big picture view of planning and development and, and how things like the province's provincial policy plays into things. And I know you've, you've uh, done a bit of research and thought into why growth happens in the first place, just from a, a big picture point of view. So why does growth happen in communities? Yeah, that's right. And this is one of my, um, I don't know if I, uh, how to call it, if it's, if it's a pet peeve or uh, just an obsession, is that we often uh, talk about growth, um, especially, uh, but, but without a good understanding, like as residents, we see how it affects our neighborhoods but we don't have a good understanding of the constraints that uh, councillors and, and city officials are working under. Okay. And, so, um, and so to me, understanding growth, but also understanding the policy uh, framework around growth helps you uh, get a better sense of, um, of, of why, why can't we stop it? Or should we stop it? Yeah, and um, and all that. And I have to apologize for my dog barking. Um, there was <laughs> there's a plane, and she needs to catch it. Okay. Um, so um, so basically, I the way I like to do things is to get from the the general to the specific. So in general, like, why do cities grow? Right. Yeah. So so, so, so cities grow because human populations tend to increase over time. And so since industrialization, um, we, our, our cities have grown, our, our residents have been moving from the rural areas into cities uh, uh, because, um, and, and this is a phenomenon called urbanization. And since the 18th century, there's been a steady increase in the number of people leaving rural areas and gathering into cities. Uh, people come to cities because they're attracted by jobs, opportunities for education, entertainment, just the general quality of life. And so today, half of the world or nearly half of the world's population live in urban areas. And so you have a growth of, okay, just let me pause this for a second. I'll pause the recording, sure. 
Okay, we've resumed. You're back. The dog is good. Um, <laughs> you were a little bit distracted, but you were talking about how nowadays, basically half of the world's population lives in cities and it's a, a demographic shift from rural areas to urban areas. That's right. And so, um, so now we have, we have these cities getting bigger and people are concentrating into cities and um, people like the quality of life, the affordability of a city will make it uh, a desirable place to live. And the more people like being a lot of people in one area, uh, for instance, um, I used to live in Lanark and there's no sushi restaurant in Lanark, but then I come to Ottawa, there's enough people who like sushi that there's, there's more variety, right? Okay. And so this is how um, urbanization gives us more options so people are attracted to life in a city. Um, so we, so that growth of population is not within any city to control. Right. 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 Um, in Ontario, going from the general to the specific, in Ontario, cities are creatures of the province. And so it is not, um, possible for a city to will itself into existence. And, um, every rule, every planning route, every growth uh, management rule that the city, cities have to obey or follow are given to them by the province. Every power that the city has is given to them by the province, right? So if the city has the capacity to collect taxes, that power is given to it by the province, right? So, so it's, um, cities cannot will themselves into existence. There's currently 344 cities in Ontario. And while it's possible for the province to create more city, that hasn't been what the appetite is for. Fiscally speaking, the province has told existing cities and manage your growth. Uh, we're not going to be creating more cities because it's cheaper, fiscally speaking, to extend infrastructure like an existing sewer system it's cheaper to extend it than to put a brand new sewer system where there previously was none well and in, in theory the administrative costs of, of having more cities would be more expensive have a lot of cities and have fewer cities and that's kind of what led to amalgamation 20 years ago in ottawa they brought all of the smaller cities together into one big city of ottawa for better or for worse, but that's the that's the that's overarching right. that's theory the, behind the, that. The appetite, the political will, is for lower taxes, more efficiency in how public dollars are spent, and this is done by growing our existing urban areas as opposed to creating cities where there were not. And and so the province directs cities what to do in terms of managing growth, and they give every municipality basically the same requirement. They, there's very specific policies and guidance for how we have to think about growth. That's right. And so, so in, in Ontario, Ontario municipalities, and I hope I won't, I won't make a mistake here, need to have 15 years of develop, de development potential planned ahead. So it doesn't mean it's all greenfield development going into farms expanding. It can be intensification, it can be expansion, can be a bit of both like it is in Ottawa. But what the province is telling the city, we don't really care what formulation you use, uh, but take your growth projections for the next 15 years and figure out where these people are going to go. Yeah, and we've just gone through this, this process. Well, we're going through it with, we're rewriting our official plan. And a big part of that is figuring out how many people do we think are going to move to Ottawa in the next 15 years and how much land do we need for the homes, for the businesses, workplaces, schools, parks, and everything else That's in right. order to meet that requirement of the province for so, 15 so years supply. Yeah. Recently, there was a, a rezoning application, Glenn, that you posted on Facebook, and it was for land in the Fernbank area. It was a rezoning. Um, in, in Ottawa, if you look on our geographic information service, a Geo Ottawa system, um, there's a zone called Development Reserve, DR. And this yes. is land that is dedicated to development. And so when when you post it on Facebook that this land would be rezoned to allow for development, um, people said, like, can't you stop this? Haven't we had enough? And I always want to say, uh, 
And people say, why do we need more houses? Well, because this land was part of a plan to accommodate the, the growth in Ottawa. Like it was never, yeah. um, it was never not going to be developed. Well, and there's two major areas in Stittsville that are slated for growth. One is the Fernbank area, which is between Hazeldean and Fernbank. Uh, a massive area. There's about probably three to thirty, three thousand to thirty-five hundred homes there now. But it's really the start of the build out of that area. And yes, those lands were designated for new homes, businesses, parks, schools, and so on. So that's one of the areas. The other area is what's known as Canada West. Now it's all in Stittsville, but essentially it's the area north of Hazeldean Road kind of um, spreading out from where Canadian Tire Center is now. I shouldn't say it's all in Stittsville because uh, the area where Tanger Outlet, Outlets is in Arcadia is part of Canada West as well. But again, if you look at a, if you were to look at a satellite map right now, there's only a little bit of that area that's filled in like around uh, the Fairwinds neighborhood. There's a ton of, uh, of land that is still slated for development. Um, the Canada Westlands was planned out about 15 to 20 years ago the Fernbank lands, the plan for that goes back 10 years. So it's been a long time that these lands have been de designated for future growth in our community. That's right. And so whenever we post about a development application, there's always a number of people who say, Glenn, can't you stop this? And the answer is quite simply no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can manage growth. We can, as a counselor's office, I mean, we can influence development application to make mm -hmm. sure that we might get more sidewalks or we might get better pathway connections or, you know, we have, you have some influence into how a development um, project goes up, but can you stop development in Sidsville? Out, outright stopping it? No, no. I, I wanted to bring us something up because I, I think, um, I think like I understand why people are resistant to growth. And one of the big things is, is concern about the effect on quality of life. Um, some people express it as they're concerned about the property values, although the trend lately has been for property values to go up and up and up significantly. So, you know, but let's express it as I'm concerned about my quality of life. And I wanted to bring up um, some comments. Uh, they were, I think this was a, t a small townhome development that was recently proposed for Maple Grove Road in the existing Fairwinds, Fairwinds neighborhood. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to bring this up because again, I think it's really emblematic, really representative of the types of comments that we receive. So, mm -hmm. um, so you can see it there on the screen, four points that this resident has raised and it's the type of thing we hear quite often from residents. The neighbor yeah. established, we should have no more construction. Uh, I'm on a small crescent. Um, I have a dog and I, I walk him in this green space. And then there's existing trees and landscaping that provide a rural feel. So th this is really typical of the kind of comments and objections we hear to almost any development yeah. approval. And, and this being in Fairwinds, in an area where it's really at the infant stage of development in this bigger Canada West area that I mentioned, you know, it's, yeah. it's a neighborhood that's been under construction for over 10 years, almost 15 years, but it's really still in the very early stages of, of development for the entire community. And this is something I find hard uh, to wrangle like as a counselor's office is that people come and they bought a house on a quiet crescent that's been zoned residential, right? Like if you, like when you purchase a house, like it's not a selling point for a home builder to tell the person um, your crescent that backs onto green space uh, is going to be construction zone for the next 15 years. It's, it's yeah. not a good selling point. So we find that people move in thinking that their neighborhood is in its final stage. But if you look at a map, uh, um, if you look at a map, you would see that the zoning is, is for residential all around you and that the large arterial roads have already been planned and that um, it, it's, it's feasible to do some homework uh, to see where the growth is coming and whether your neighborhood is, is, in, is in its final um, iteration. Yeah. And the, we also get a lot of comments about the loss of green space. And this is something we see a lot in Stittsville where you have a lot of former farm fields where people walk their dogs and take their walks, but it was always private property and people have been trespassing for years. And then when 
the inevitable growth happens on that parcel, people uh, feel like they've just lost something that was theirs when it had never been. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And by the way, we should add too, if, if anyone's interested in looking at future development in Stittsville, I would definitely do a Google search for Canada West concept plan and also mm -hmm. for a Fernbank community design plan. The other thing you can do is you can call 311 and ask to be connected with a development information officer, a DIO. That person's job is to communicate with the public. If you have a question about what's possible for that land near the home I'm about to buy, or what's going to happen with that land near where I live now, uh, call 311 and ask for a DIO, and they can help you walk mm -hmm. you through what's in the plans and what's the potential. It's a lot of people don't know these resources are available, so I wanted to mention it. But you know, I, I get these comments, right? It's all about quality of life. So, so yeah. what what's happening here? Why why? You know, how can we keep allowing growth if it's affecting our, our, the quality of our communities? That's right. And this is something that, that we hear a lot about. Like, and and um, when we say that good quality of life in Ottawa attracts people, um, and then people always say, well, no, I want to maintain my quality of life. I just don't want you to build more homes. Right? right? So keep the quality of life as it is. Just don't bring more people. And if I can get a little bit philosophical here, there's an excellent book called Suburban Nation. Um, and if you um, have, if you don't want to read the book, there's also a lecture. I'm just looking if the book is handy. It's not. Um, but there's also a lecture on YouTube. Um, and they explore that, um, that sense that it's, it's a conundrum of um, suburban areas all over North America that people love where they live. Uh, I live in Granite Ridge. Um, I, I rent a home in Granite Ridge. When I walk around my neighborhood, I see a lot of pride of ownership, right? People have these mini oasis. Uh, um, it, that's, you know, they're, they're private property. There's a lot of pride of ownership. And it's, it's that conundrum that we love where we live, uh, but we don't want more of it built, right? right? And, so, and it's a bit of a, of a conflict when, especially when you talk about urban expansion or more growth, like in, uh, in Westwood, for instance, where people say, oh no, I love my neighborhood, but just don't build more of it. Um, and, and in suburban nation, they, ex they, they explore that question in terms of a tension between the, the private realm and the public realm. So the, your private realm is what you own, your car, your home, uh, where you live, your backyard. The public realm are shared spaces in the city. So your public park, your roadway, your sidewalk, all those shared amenities, uh, well, your, your rec center, your library, that's the public realm. And um, over the years, um, we've, especially in, in North America, but especially in Ontario, I would say, we've had a desire to pay lower taxes and to not increase taxes and and that has led to an impoverishment of the public realm um, in paris for instance if i can take that so uh, i'm french so is my family so i have a lot of family living in paris and um and so i look at my cousins i have cousin my age who has three young children in paris and their backyard they don't have one it's a deck right but they have the Bois de Vincennes just around the corner, right? So they, they leave these densely packed neighborhood where they, have, they don't really have much of a private realm, but then they hit these beautiful parks that are meant to be where people congregate, where people eat when it's really hot, um, um, it, and it's beautiful, right? And so Brent O'Darian, the urbanist, speaks a lot about density with amenities. Like what makes density livable is appropriate amenities where people can seek refuge, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, so by impoverishing the, the public realm and people have invested in their own private little oasis, their own private realm, um, we've now created a competition right? Because density, instead of bringing more services, a bigger tax base, more money, um, it, that's, what, that's what density should bring us. Um, 
But instead, because we invest so little in shared amenities in the public realm, now every new neighbor becomes a competitor. So, right? yes, so we see this so reflection. We're not competing for a small, so the pie is not changing. The pie is fixed. The, private, yeah. the, the public realm is fixed. It's a fixed pie. And every new street we add, now our share of that public realm is getting smaller and smaller. And so density, instead of bringing better service, uh, it makes it puts us in competition for a smaller piece of the pie. And this, this is why over, over a community, we resent growth. It's and, because and you now can see... our roads are more congested congested or so our parks and well, and you see that this the smaller piece of the pie you see it in a practical terms you see it you know it might get harder and harder to get a spot at swimming lessons because although you're mm -hmm. adding more people you haven't necessarily built another another swimming pool or you might see it in um um, you know, your, your roads get more congestion. 20 years ago, there was less traffic to get downtown from Spitzville um, than there is now. Or you might see it in your bus. Uh, your bus is probably more crowded than it was a year or two ago because you have more people moving. Now, eventually, your bus gets to a point where the city will decide, okay, let's add a second bus. Or, you know, so you, you have that, um, you have, you can make the slice of the pie bigger, but there's so many things, schools, uh, portables, mm -hmm. Uh, more and more kids in portable. So there's always this sort of this lag between when people move here and when the amenities catch up. And and it's both public sector and it's private sector. You know, like there's communities like the Fernbank community does not really have a a a good coffee shop or a good grocery store within walking distance. Mm -hmm. uh, so so there's always this this catch up that seems to happen. That's right. And this catch up, like so, by the time from since we see that in transit in Stittsville, is that by the time they add another route of the 262, people are so angry that they're not grateful that they just got a new bus. It no. just took so long to get to a point where, where we got that new public amenity transit that, that people are just getting more and more cynical about density and are just not welcoming new neighbors because it puts them in competition. And so I'd like to move on from that to say like, why are we lagging? Yes. Because people will say, but Glenn, why can't the city just build the road first, finish Robert Grant, then build around it, right? So, so again, going back to public feedback, I think the number one thing we hear about when there's new development proposals is around the transportation infrastructure. So we hear things like, well, Carp Road hasn't been widened yet, and there's a ton of traffic there. Um, Robert Grant Avenue isn't built yet. It's built from Fernbank to Abbott Street, but it's supposed to connect all the way up to the Queensway. Until we have these road projects built, can't we just stop any new homes from be being built in Spitzville? And the quick answer to that is no, because growth funds the amenity. We have a principle in, in Ottawa, it's an Ontario thing, where the idea is that growth should pay for growth. And that makes sense because if there's 3,000 new homes being built in the Fernbank neighborhood um, and it requires a new road or new schools, it should be that growth, um, the actual building of the homes, the home builders or the businesses that are there who fund um, the, the new capital growth projects, schools, roads, libraries, police, fire, and so on. So we have a formula in Ontario where 90% of the cost of new amenities to support new neighborhoods is paid for through what's called development charges. The other 10% is shared amongst the existing tax base, I guess because the idea is that, you know, if you had a new library in the Fernbank area, it'll benefit some of the people who might live in, say, Granite Ridge. Or if you build Robert Grant Avenue, primarily it's there to support um, the people who live in the Fernbank area, but other people in the community will also make use of Robert Grant Avenue. So 90% of the funding comes from a charge added to every new home, business, retail development, um, and 10% comes from the existing tax base. So that's development charges. Mm -hmm. And the every new home pays how much for development charges approximately? It if I recall correctly, it's about 35000 for a single family home. Okay. And that goes up kind of an inflationary rate every year. And it's meant to reflect the cost of new infrastructure. The problem is in Ottawa is that for many years, Ottawa did not collect enough development charges. Um, Ottawa wanted to set development charges higher, 
Uh, there was one case where the development industry appealed that and the province sided with the builders and said, Ottawa, you can't charge that much in development charges. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was one thing that happened. Another thing that happened is that um, the cost of construction keeps going up. So a, to build a road costs tens of millions of dollars more now than it might have 10 years ago. So we've got this issue where we probably aren't collecting enough development charges and the cost of construction is going up. So you've got this huge gap um, in, in funding these projects. So all the homes arrive first and then the infrastructure gets paid for after. Um, if we were to stop growth, we would stop having the ability to bring in more development charges. Without development charges, we can't fund the new infrastructure. We mm -hmm. could, but the options aren't so good. <laughs> but it's a political choice that we made, right? Yes. In a way, if, if we say, if I'm a resident of Ottawa and I said, I don't want my taxes to pay for a road to be built in a farmer's field where there will eventually be 35,000 new families, right? Like, so those are all political choices we made over years. If we decide we don't want to increase our taxes more than by the rate of inflation, that's a political decision that we as voters make and ask our council to enact. We don't want to pay a lot of taxes. We don't want to borrow a lot of money. So it leaves like the, in terms of managing growth and the cost of growth, like our tools, the levers that we have at our disposal for funding amenities, public services, they're kind of limited. So if the, if the residents of Ottawa say, well, you, you can't borrow because I don't like that. You can't increase my taxes, but I don't like that then it leaves, well, we're going to build, we're going to build the new, the, the, the development charges is what we have left, but then you need to build more houses before you can build the roads. Like it's, yeah. it's a matter of trade-offs, right? Yeah. I mean, you could, you could decide to fund uh, the water, the sewer, the roads, the libraries, the police from the existing tax base. Let's just take, if you were to build out Robert Grant Avenue, um, it's, it's a project that's tens of millions of dollars. So if you don't pay for that out of development charges from new homes, it would have to be shared amongst all the taxpayers in Ottawa. You'd be looking at tens of millions of dollars extra in the city's budgets each year, which would re represent a, a tax increase much higher than inflation. And I don't think there's a lot of appetite for that um, amongst uh, people here in Ottawa. And by the way, this isn't a, an issue specific to Spitzville. Um, no. This gap in the funding is we see it in Canada, we see it in Barhaven, we see it in Orleans, and there are road projects across the entire city that are five to 10 years behind where they are. Think of Carp Road, mm -hmm. for example, or Robert Grant Avenue should have been built at least to Hazeldean Road by now, and it's mm -hmm. still probably two to three years away from even getting started. Um, there's, there's things we're working on, we're hoping to accelerate that, but ultimately uh, we need those development charges in order to fund these big projects. That's right, and so, so growth can be good and if it brings more taxes, more development charges and, and, uh, and all that. But in Ottawa, we're playing this constant game of catch up, uh, which is in turn causing a lot of, of cynicism towards yeah. growth. Uh, yeah, that's you, for sure. You, you sort of touched on it earlier around when you were talking about Lanark and sushi restaurants, um, how a higher population, I mean, a higher population supports better retail, a uh, higher population also, um, it ten, what you tend to see in urban areas is, is you have more, um, um, not amenities, like cultural amenities, I guess is what I'm getting mm -hmm. at. You know, um, if you have a very small community, it's unlikely you would have a, um, maybe a community theater. But if you have a larger community, there's more people who'll be interested in theater and maybe we'll take the time to set something like that up. You have more variety in, in the kinds of things you can do, the kinds of businesses. But going back to, um, um, it's a question we often get about Fernbank, the Fernbank area. There is land along Fernbank that's zoned mixed use and the intention is to have commercial there, neighborhood commercial, which could be a small grocery store or a coffee shop or a, a pharmacy. It's not built yet. The reason it's not built is because the businesses that will open a store there, um, they need to have a business case to do that. They need a certain minimum population um, around that store in order to make it viable. And that's something we get a lot of questions, questions on as well. Yeah, and, and um, there's this, um, 
I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not sure that, that there's a connection between like, well, I haven't seen it. Maybe it exists, but I haven't seen it. Is that the city makes its growth projections and it will like in the front bank CDP, for instance, community design plan, um, they will have like densities, right? Like this area should support this density of population. I've never really seen a consideration of like, because I'm I've been looking for this information. It's like what density supports a grocery store? Right. So if you're a grocery store owner, how many people do you need in like A, what's your catchment area for your company, your franchise, or whatever? Like, what's your catchment area? Where do you draw from? How many rooftops, you know, do you need to support a grocery store? Yes. And, and I'm not sure. Like I said, if this information is, is available at the city, I never found it. <laughs> um, I found papers uh, online and blog posts about that. But, um, and, and I think that we set up these lands and the planning saying like, this is where the apartment goes and this is where transit goes and this is where the grocery store goes. But nobody asks transit, like how long until we can support a transit route there nobody asked this the, the store like how many rooftops before you can build a grocery well, store there's a great thing uh maybe we'll add it to the notes on youtube it's it's called 250 things an architect should know and it's by a, <laughs> an architect named michael sorkin and, and yeah. one of them on that list is an architect should know the density needed to support a pharmacy um, so, you know, there definitely is a correlation between the number of rooftops, the number of homes, and how many grocery stores you can have, or how many coffee shops, or how many pharmacies. And a lot of people say, can the city require a business to, to build the store because we need a grocery store in our community? The city can't do that. It's, it's yeah. got to be supported by enough residents to make it a viable business. And I've asked that of city planners, like, how many rooftops support a grocery store? And Either they were trying to get rid of me, but maybe, but none of them could give me that information. And, and part of me hopes they know because it is very relevant to why people move to a certain area, right? Like if yeah. that, that walkable amenity, that vision that they sell at the sale center, you know, it's, it's something that people, um, that people buy into and then, and then get disappointed when, oh, it's, it might take another 10 years before the school's here. So your kid's going to get bused. I don't know. Like your daughter, you have daughters that get bused to Richmond for high school, they do. right? They do. Which, they do. which is kind of mind boggling when you think about it. But yeah. that's, that's the name of the game. So I want to, so putting development charges aside, let's assume we find another way to fund our Robert Grant Avenue. Uh, may, maybe the provincial or federal government give us some, some stimulus money um, for infrastructure. Um, there are cities that have actually have have their growth constrained by some physical means or, or otherwise what happens when cities stop growing or can't grow because i know you've looked into a few examples there well it's it's kind of this is kind of something i'm going to say as not an economist right <laughs> but i would say you look at la and you look at vancouver okay or or and or any city that's on an island right that as a physical constraint to grow, right? Okay. Whether you want to keep growing or not, you are constrained. Uh, there's a mountain range like Vancouver. You're between the mountains and the sea. Like you're not going anywhere. And LA, right? Which has a mix of the ocean and also policies that have been very restrictive of growth. Um, so when I say LA and Vancouver, What's the first thing that comes to mind in terms of livability and, and housing? For me, it's, it's a very, very expensive place to live. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's basically unaffordable, yeah. right? I would never be able to move to Vancouver with my family. If, if I had a job opportunity in Vancouver, I'd have to live way out of it. Uh, um, you know, and, and so when you, when, if you constrain growth, uh, <laughs> you're not stopping the people from moving into your area. You're just forcing them further out and driving in. And you drive your, your real estate prices way, way up. And we're seeing a little bit of that in Ottawa because um, we've had a lot of opposition to intensification and urban expansion. 
um, people in Ottawa, like I said, are generally very cynical of growth and tend to oppose it. And, mm -hmm. and so do their, their counselors. And I'm not picking on urban counselors. I'm picking on everyone. Um, so, so in Ottawa, like I was recently visiting a, a new home, a new build in Stittsville. It was a four bedroom town home and it was 550, like wow. five, $550,000, wow. 550. Like I can, on my middle class salary, cannot afford a home in Stittsville or anywhere in the city I, I was born in, right? I grew up in. And so to me, it was a bit of an eye opener where I said, oh, wait, like if I'm priced out of Ottawa and we're renting right now for that reason, if even me, like I was like, if even me is priced out of Ottawa, like what does that say about everyone yeah. who makes less money than I do? Well, I think, um, I think that's the thing, right? Like people often ask, well, where, where is all this growth coming from? Where are the people coming from? There is such a huge demand on housing right now in all parts of Ottawa. I mean, if you check out, you know, Saturday morning when one of the builders is releasing um, their next phase of their development, you will often see lineups out the door and down the street. Like there's a huge demand from home. So it's not that the city is, is promoting growth necessarily. It's that the, the builders are responding to the market demand for it. And then you think about a city like, um, LA or Vancouver, and yes, the housing prices are, are very high within the city limits. And in Vancouver, um, you see so many high rises and, and towers to accommodate the need for homes. But you also see around both of those cities, a lot of sprawl, a lot of suburbanization, because people tend to you know, drive an hour, an hour and a half, two hours out of the city, and they'll live with a longer commute because that's what they can afford. There's a, a phrase, um, uh, drive, drive until you qualify. You know, and we heard that during our yes. open discussion. People were saying that even in Ottawa, it's drive until you qualify. Move and I can further and I was oh. say, move move further and further out until you qualify for a mortgage because home prices and my, are. Low. My daughter, my oldest daughter is twenty four, and 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 her her partner is a bit older, and they're looking at like their 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 peers are buying their first homes. This is very anecdotal, not statistics, but. I look at my daughter's peers and they're buying in Arm Prior, they're buying in Kentley, they're buying in Kentville. None of that, that my, my children are not buying in Ottawa, right? Yeah. Like their first home, they can't. We are seeing that. We see, if we were to stop growth in Stittsville, Canada, Bar, if we were to stop growth in Ottawa, um, people would still want to buy a home somewhere. They need to move somewhere. Um, and if they move to Carleton Place or Arm Prior or Kentville, they are not paying taxes to Ottawa. They're not paying development charges, but they're still coming to work here, to live here, to shop here. So they're getting all the benefits of living outside of Ottawa, but Ottawa doesn't get a benefit of, uh, of, of any of the property taxes yeah. or, or having those people living here. So that's why it's so difficult to, um, to say, we, you know, stop growth because we're not, a, there's cities around us. There's external factors here. Yeah, because that's what I was saying at the beginning. Like you can say stop growth in Ottawa, and you could stop growth in Ottawa and feel very self-righteous about having stopped growth in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. The people have not gone anywhere. Yeah. The people are setting up in other cities. They're setting up around Ottawa. They're shacking up in, in different uh, creative arrangements inside the city. Um, th like I said, it, it, there's a certain self-righteousness as like, we need to stop growth as if these people, which are real families, <laughs> yeah. were suddenly disappearing and uh, which they aren't. You're just pushing them somewhere else and then, and then patting yourself on the back for not expanding. So uh, th there actually is a way we could slow down growth or stop growth, but I, I, I don't think people would be open to it. Can um, I guess? Well, the cities that are not growing are cities where the economy is tanking, where people are getting laid off, where there's no jobs, where there's high crime, where there's pollution, where there's awful traffic. The fact that we're growing is actually a reflection that we do have a healthy economy and that we do have a very safe place to live and a high quality of living. So growth yeah. is an indicator of, of a healthy community. I think the challenge we have is how do you manage that growth? That's a word that you used a little bit earlier. How do you manage that growth so that you're not seeing a decline in the, the good things that we have? Yeah. So that's how you stop growth. Like you make Ottawa a really crummy place to live <laughs> yeah. where nobody wants to move. 
and, um, and and that will take care of the problem but then all of us will be living in a crummy place which you know I no, kind of like and, and I know I know there's resistance to new homes being built I totally get that and I mean I, I recognize the gap that we have in transportation amenities and schools and retail um, it's something that that you and I you know working at City Hall or something we're focused on all the time is how do we close those gaps how do we change policies? How do we find new funding sources? Because we don't want to fall behind. Um, mm -hmm. We want to keep on having a great community and a great city to live in. Um, but I think, I think too, it's important, you know, as a bit of a recap. So, I mean, Stittsville is a community that's far from complete. We have about 35 to 40,000 people now. That's probably going to double in the next 25 years. So we're going to see many more new neighbors in our community. Um, we're going to see a lot of that growth in the Fernbank area and the Canada West area. So where you see a lot of empty fields right now, that's gonna be where you see growth. I think we'll also see growth on some of the big parking lots, maybe at Canadian Tire Center, maybe along Hazeldean Road, we're gonna see more growth there. We're gonna see in our city more uh, growth inside as well, inside the Greenbelt, more intensification there. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that came up the official plan is, you know, this growth isn't endless. We're putting things in our new official plan to protect farmland, for example. And we're, we're trying to look at you know, um, where, how, when does growth stop? So it's not that, that Stittsville or Canada or Barhaven are gonna keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We're, we're almost built out at this point. I'd say we probably have another generation or two of growth before it really can't grow out any further. Um, but I think the other important thing is, is our communities are changing. And I know change is, is, is difficult. Change can be really concerning. Change brings some good things and some bad things. And, and maybe that goes back to what we were just talking about. How do you manage that growth in a way that is a positive for, for residents rather than, rather than being a negative? Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. Um, it's amazing how fast these discussions go and we're, we're kind of up on our time limit, but yeah. um, always a pleasure to chat about this. Um, Want to thank uh, viewers for sending your feedback and suggestions. Um, we don't know when the next one will be, and uh, we kind of do these, try to keep them topical and try to answer your questions or, you know, um, uh, discuss things that happen to come up in the course of our day-to-day -day work at City Hall. So if you have any ideas or, or suggestions, maybe add it to the comments here on the YouTube channel or, uh, or send an email. And um, it's been great to chat about it. Thanks, Beto. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Bye. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you.